might be set to go. Um, let me just get the um, slide back up um, and there may be a few more joining. So we'll let them join in due course. Um, but first of all, um, before I say anything else, let's um, just uh, gather ourselves and I'll just say a short prayer, which is the prayer of St. Benedict, which hopefully you can see on the screen in front of you. O gracious and holy Father, give us wisdom to perceive you, intelligence to understand you, diligence to seek you, patience to wait for you, eyes to behold you, a heart to meditate upon you, and a life to proclaim you, through the power of the Spirit of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Good, well, welcome back to uh, many of you who joined us for a course in the uh, spring, uh, which was um, looking at um, uh, some of the big questions of, um, of uh, Christian faith. And um, it's good to invite many more people who have uh, since uh, joined for this course, which, um, as the title suggests, is um, seeking to take us through the Bible um, over the course of the, uh, well, the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, it, this side of Christmas, and then um, in the new year, um, uh, um, uh, the New Testament, which is the obvious uh, <laughs> corollary of the Old Testament, uh, which we will um, be, be exploring as well. And hopefully along the way, um, I, should, I might be bringing in some um, uh, uh, one or two others um, who um, are um, knowledgeable about uh, the Bible, so you're not just listening to me all the way through it. Um, but if you haven't been joined us for a cathedral uh, course before, my name is um, Daniel Inman and I'm the Chancellor here with responsibility for um, uh, education and, and learning uh, more broadly. And uh, as many of you know, we were sort of hoping to sort of get our School of Theology and Prayer underway this autumn, with, but with uh, Paul Cannon Lane still somewhat out of action for COVID reasons, uh, we decided keeping things online was probably in the short term the best uh, option available to us but um, uh, I'm pleased to say that there are there are um, some others uh, other teachers who are hoping to offer a range of different courses in due course so um, do keep your eyes out for all of those. Um, just a reminder to all of you as um, we undertake the course that um, just due to um, the chaos if uh, people keep talking over each other um, I think we learned that from the first session it's better to use the chat function which you will see um, hopefully at the, uh, on, on the bottom of your screen. If you've got a question, just type it in there. Um, and at the end of the, uh, the, the session, um, I will um, invite, invite um, you to uh, uh, articulate that question um, and then um, hopefully offer some, some answers. So the course which I'm hoping to offer to you over the course of the next few months is one which um, I hope will offer something for everybody um, in the sense that um, there are some of you out there who probably have quite um, limited uh, experience of studying the Bible for, for whatever reason and there's no judgment about that at all. Many people of course uh, find that they, um, their only main experience with the Bible is on a Sunday in the liturgy um, and so you know that, that they hear the Bible as part of the lectionary, uh, but it's not something that they're used to exploring in depth. There are others of you who are very well versed in the Bible, um, and it's great to have you as part of this. And even some of you I know who even taught uh, uh, courses on the Bible. So there's quite a range of experience, but I hope what is offered here is a refresher for some and will open up new vistas for others. <coughs> and um, that's uh, um, um, yeah, that, that's, uh, that this will be, be of use to you. I'll talk more about how, how the rest of the course will um, proceed, but today I'm going to just really give you an introduction to thinking about the Bible, about its different uh, genre and uh, its background. How do we receive this, uh, this book of books? Um, and uh, where is it set? Who are the people that we're talking about when we're studying the Bible? Uh, and what are the ways in which it might be of um, importance to us today? And I suppose um, uh, that's a good place to start. Um, <clears throat> I 
Tokyo. Um, here is um, uh, just a little bit of exploration really about how the Bible continues to influence us, uh, even in quite a secular age here in uh, the western part of the world. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, yeah, here's, uh, there's the Supreme Court of the United States by way of starters, um, nothing to do with um, uh, Amy, Amy, what's that? Amy Coney Barrett, who's the Supreme Court nominee at the moment. Although that's absolutely fascinating because of course she's a Roman Catholic um, and uh, so has particular views uh, morally. How does that relate to the law? Um, uh, but I put the Supreme Court there really just to underline that even if the Bible isn't something which you hear quoted in the Houses of Parliament or in Congress, the Bible um, underpins uh, the moral framework which shapes the, um, the, 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 uh, the legal frameworks of most, most of our countries. Some of the very basic things um, which are incorporated in the Ten Commandments, for instance. But not just the Ten Commandments, I suppose I'm thinking also about, um, uh, in that respect, um, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, where Jacques Maritain, who was a great Catholic uh, theologian and ethicist in the 20th century, was really instrumental in bringing together this, this universal framework of um, human rights, which uh, remains of such importance for uh, our legal framework uh, today. Uh, and of course that's been drawn out of the natural law tradition in the Roman Catholic world, but uh, of course that interacts with um, scripture's own commandments. Um, you'll see there in the middle, um, whilst I was talking, Piero del Francesco, uh, his depiction of the resurrection in San Sepulcro has uh, reappeared uh, there. Uh, absolutely glorious um, uh, uh, mural, in fact, or fresco, um, which is well worth visiting um, in, in Umbria if you ever go there. Uh, and I put that there really as just as an example of um, the, the degree to which the biblical story um, shaped the visual world of um, the Middle Ages, of course, uh, the great masters, uh, but through to our time as well, there's a, you know, you only need to watch um, many of our films and you'll see that um, there's often a, a range of different biblical devices, biblical um, uh, underlying stories which are being returned to, apart from you know, stories which are you know, uh, films about Moses or Noah or whatever. So uh, in terms of the cultural imagination, the, the stories of the Bible continue to uh, filter through our society. Um, and that's no less true, of course, uh, for music. Uh, I think that's a little bit, that's a little bit of Bach. I can't actually quite read it, um, <laughs> the whole score, but just as an example there of the ways in which um, the Western musical classical tradition um, has obviously been uh, deeply imbued with the words of scripture uh, from the very beginnings where uh, psalms would have been chanted um, and then written down. Um, but uh, all the way through to um, the romantic, the, the Baroque romantic period, um, uh, and and the core traditions of the churches. But um, apart from that, you could look at someone like, um, as I'm sure many of you are great fans of uh, Kanye West, um, or um, I try to think of the other one who's now uh, really he's just become a Christian. Maybe that is Kanye. Um, uh, but um, uh, maybe it's Jay Z. But anyway, um, uh, and Justin Bieber's another one who's just been uh, invoking parts of the Bible in his own pop songs. Um, so the Bible is still very much prevalent uh, and can be picked up on in a whole variety of ways in popular culture as well. Um, that is, uh, if uh, you, you spot a, uh, at home, uh, I don't know whether you, anyone wants to make a guess about who that is, but um, actually I could spend a long time guessing, but that's Isaac Newton. And I put Isaac Newton there really to underline the fact that the Bible um, is uh, incredibly important for the development of early uh, science in the West. Um, because the Bible um, at the outset in Genesis 1 makes it very clear that the universe is ordered and structured, it means that the world can be studied and it's, uh, it it's re can be reliably studied because you know it's constant and held in its constancy by God. Uh, and, and certainly that would be be the, the, the worldview which uh, shaped um, Newton's own uh, uh, methods. Um, so, um, so, so the Bible's um, uh, cosmology um, 
gives a freedom to for, for scientists to study it. Uh, of course, we tend to think now of sort of the great battles between um, uh, someone like Dawkins and the Christian faith, but it's easy, therefore, to to forget the very um, uh, crucial relationship between uh, the church and uh, science in the early modern period. Um, uh, I've actually got that's the, the front uh, cover of the King James Bible, which um, may be the, the translation which many of you have to hand. That's uh, of course uh, translated in 1611 uh, under King James the um, first. And this text, this translation of the Bible, um, which was building upon earlier translations during the Reformation, um, is so important for um, our whole language, uh, the English language and its uh, developments, um, whether it's you know, key phrases like uh, eye for an eye, for instance, or um, uh, uh, well, any, any of the, 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 key, the key phrases which uh, infiltrate our language in that respect relating to, to the Bible along with Shakespeare and the Book of Common Prayer. Um, translations are, um, are that, that translation is, is crucial in the shaping of uh, English literature. Um, uh, there's a professor at Oxford, Val Cunningham, who's a wonderful man who who's, uh, teaches English, but uh, he would always say to me, he was absolutely astonished the degree to which um, uh, uh, new undergraduates had really no uh, understanding of um, the Bible and the biblical stories. Um, so before they, they come up to Oxford now, he, he encourages them all to at least read good chunks of the Bible to get a handle on some of the, the literary um, resonances which uh, filter through um, Shakespeare and well, not, not Shakespeare, it's a bit, it's a bit earlier, but, um, uh, but uh, Milton um, and uh, through to you know, Dickens, um, uh, but even just being able to read um, Dante uh, and the Divine Comedy, if you don't have any understanding of the biblical world, um, these key texts are just inaccessible to you. And then, of course, there's the ways in which the Bible feeds into um, the, the history of humankind. Uh, and I put Martin Luther King Jr. there as, uh, I suppose, a, a very important example of the way in which the Bible has been used to transform society. Um, William Blake, for instance, would be a good example of someone who was uh, urged very strongly uh, upon his own world that the Bible was not just there to be studied historically, critically or literally. The Bible is there to lead to action, to change the world and to bring uh, justice and um, God's uh, liberation. And uh, Luther King, uh, of course, uh, uses um, uh, the language of Exodus, as of course many um, enslaved people would have done uh, many, many generations before him uh, in America and in the Caribbean, um, to, to call upon society to uh, bring dignity and justice and equality um, for, um, for, for black people in, in the United States. Uh, which is also to underline the ways in which the Bible has been used um, uh, rather negatively, uh, to say the least. Um, I was uh, giving a lecture the other day on the use of uh, the, the Church of England's involvement in slavery in the, uh, the 17th and 18th centuries. And of course, um, slaves exist in the New Testament, uh, and Paul isn't urging the, the liberation of someone like Onesimus in, in the book of Philemon. Um, and uh, for that, for that reason, uh, the Bible has been used to justify um, uh, conditions which, uh, which now we would deem to be morally repugnant. Um, so it's, uh, it's an ambiguous text in that respect as well. And, and that, of course, feeds through into uh, our own uh, debates, our own day around uh, gender and sexuality and how the Bible uh, is to be approached. Um, and uh, why have I put the, the Queen there? Well. Um, I mean, the, the coronation service is a prime example of a way in which the Hebrew Bible and uh, ideas about um, Christian kingship uh, still informs our very constitution. Uh, the Queen is anointed with holy oil uh, in the same way in which um, uh, Solomon and David, David were. Um, and um, 
so I, I put the Queen there really as an example of the ways in which uh, the Bible um, and power uh, are inter intricately connected and, and have been um, from earliest times, really. Um, so uh, uh, for good and, and for ill, I suppose. Um, so that, that is um, just, just a broad overview, really, of, um, of, of the ways in which the Bible continues to influence us um, even if uh, we feel we're not we're not reading it every day, even if you don't hear about it every day, uh, it is always there, very just beneath the surface, um, and um, and being uh, wielding its own influence upon our discourses, public and private. Okay. Um, but this sort of begs the question: Well, what is it? Um, and um, uh, in fact, you would have thought I would have had uh, my Bible immediately to hand, but it's, um, <laughs> it was uh, downstairs um, uh, whilst I was trying to deal with various technological issues. Um, but the Bible as we have it now, which is, you know, a single book, uh, um, in my case, a pretty now tatty book covered with uh, scribbles and thoughts uh, over uh, many moons, um, is, of course, not how Christians have experienced it for um, the vast majority of our history. For one thing, it's not a single book. Um, it's, uh, uh, it's an edited volume, a collection of writings. It's a book of books and Bible just, uh, you know, comes from the Biblia, um, which means library. So uh, in a sense, it's, it's a library of sacred texts. Uh, 39 books in the Old Testament, uh, 27 in the New, um, and gathered over a very long period of time. Uh, we're talking about um, 1300 years in terms of uh, the written documents that we have. Um, and it doesn't feature in the form that we might know it um, ourselves uh, now in terms of a, a readily accessible, purchasable book until, um, until the, the emergence of the printing press um, uh, by, by Johannes Gutenberg. Um, and even then, of course, the, the capacity of people to to buy and, and own a Bible is something which is, is not really prevalent until you know, much later. Nonetheless, it, it is still the most popular book, uh, a collection of books um, that, uh, that is sold each year. Um, I, I think um, uh, the university presses uh, sell about 200,000 copies uh, of, of Bibles each year. So, uh, you know, the appetite for these sacred words are enormous. And what is it? Well, it's not, uh, because it's not one single um, book, we're not here talking about, um, uh, you know, one single kind of uh, guidebook to how to run your life. It's not a... Um, we're muted, but I don't know how to unmute it, but as long as he's not. Uh, yes, just if we can make sure we're all muted, um, hopefully, hopefully that's the case, good. Um, so, um, it, you know, it's not a, it doesn't have a single theological vision or single moral vision. Um, it's a series of often very different responses to God acting in history, uh, whether through Israel um, uh, or in the New Testament in response to um, Jesus Christ. Um, and uh, because it comes from uh, its, its contents emerge from a variety of different contexts, um, uh, and at uh, times uh, in history, there, it has all the diversity which you would expect to see. Um, and in that sense, um, we, we often talk about religions of the book. Um, and I think that's certainly true of the Quran, which uh, of course uh, Muslims would claim to be a direct communication um, to uh, the prophet uh, Muhammad. Um, uh, or even uh, sort of later uh, religious manifestations, someone like um, Joseph Smith uh, in relation to the Mormons, who uh, I think he heard, the, the, he said to have heard the Book of Mormon um, from behind a um, from behind a screen, um, uh, sort of directly communicated to him by an angel. Um, interestingly, the angel had many of the grammatical and um, Made, made many of the grammatical errors which are actually feature in the 1611 uh, version of the King James Bible. Uh, that, that's another story. Um, but th that's to underline really that um, we're, not, we're not talking about a direct communication from God um, in the sense that um, Muslims would 
claim for for the Quran. And Christianity has only um, only very recently really kind of elevated the Bible to a state of being completely inerrant, completely free of all um, all, all faults. Um, and, and that's a sort of feature of, um, I suppose, from my point of view, from um, uncertainty and doubt in the late 19th century, which uh, encourages Protestants to invest an authority um, in the scriptures um, to give them a sense of confidence that, uh, uh, that there's, there's a part of their faith which cannot be shaken whatsoever um, and um, which cannot be challenged in the face of the various challenges which were present in 19th century um, Europe and America. Um, and actually you can see perhaps in uh, the other, other side of uh, the church, in the Roman Catholic Church, that the proclamation of papal infallibility uh, only really finds itself um, being fully expressed in 1871 in the First Vatican Council. And likewise, I'd, I'd say that that's a response to um, a, a, an age of uncertainty where there's a need to um, condense authority in a particular way. Um, but as I say, the Bible as we receive it um, uh, is, is a series of testimonies to God's self-revelation over many centuries. Uh, and supremely in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus of Nazareth. And Christians will want to say that God's supreme revelation is not in writings, but in a person, in Jesus of Nazareth. Um, and the Bible is, uh, is incredibly important. It's, a, it's our primary authority for thinking about God uh, and about how to live a good life, for sure. Um, and, uh, and with all that entails in, in the way in which the church makes decisions, I'm not uh, questioning that. Um, but we mustn't um, forget that, um, that Jesus is, is the supreme manifestation of God uh, in the Christian tradition, uh, rather than um, a, particular, a particular text. The texts are important because they bear witness to him in the New Testament. And when in 1 Timothy, there's an oft quoted uh, verse there in 1 Timothy 3, um, where uh, the, the Bible is uh, spirit filled and inspired and uh, useful for teaching and for rebuking. Um, uh, St. Paul or one of St. Paul's followers uh, who wrote that, um, uh, that they, they wouldn't have been referring there to the New Testament. There wasn't a New Testament in that sense at that point. They would have been referring back um, to, to the scriptures which they, were, which they heard in the synagogue, i.e. the Old Testament, uh, the Hebrew Bible. Um, but we'll come on to, on to how, that's, um, how, how the early church came to see this, these texts as inspired and authoritative uh, in a moment. And of course, how, how, how did people um, uh, come to uh, receive and uh, know these texts? Well, in the you, if you go to a synagogue today, of course, you will you will see that um, the, the the Hebrew Bible is um, kept within uh, scrolls, which are taken out of uh, uh, you know the the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, as it were, uh, and and read read by um, rabbis um, uh, to to the um, to the synagogue, um, and that of course was for early Christians uh, precisely precisely the same. Um, uh, papyrus was uh, um, sewn together um, to create long scrolls which uh, as it says here were, were read from left to right um, and uh, so there's no, th this wasn't a book in a sense you had um, uh, yeah, individual scrolls for individual books and um, our, our most famous evidence for such scrolls from that period is of course the Dead Sea Scrolls which um, was probably the most significant um, discovery in relation to the Bible in the 20th century found uh, just after the Second World War um, on the West Bank. And there were in these caves uh, rolled up <clears throat> all these scrolls which uh, related uh, to relating to the Old Testament which were kept by the Qumran community, uh, a community which uh, I think we're, we're still continuing to learn about and um, understand how they sort of uh, withdrew from Jerusalem and out into the, in, out into the deserts with their own particular um, theological and uh, religious concerns, um, but um, but but there you will see um, the the various books of the Old Testament, uh, which um, 
which was an important discovery in a sense because the Hebrew Bible, um, the Old Testament, as we know it today, um, is, uh, comes from what they call the, the Masoretic text. The, the Masoretes were those um, people in um, uh, sort of the 8th to 10th centuries who um, were in Jerusalem, um, in uh, uh, Tiberias, um, and were uh, devoted their time to passing on the tradition which was sort of you know, writing down um, uh, writing down the, the text of the Old Testament from scrolls, um, but also putting their annotations into uh, the margins. And um, the, the key, the key um, manuscript um, is the Leningrad Codex, which is from the 10th century, uh, from which pretty much all um, Old Testaments take their, uh, and Jewish Bibles take their um, starting points. Uh, that's the 10th century um, AD. In fact, I thought we had a picture of it. Here it is. Um, so you can see here, I mean, here's the Hebrew text, um, but Hebrew, as many of you will know, doesn't have vowels, um, which might make it seem like it's incredibly hard to read. Um, but actually, if, if you took all the vowels out of a sentence, most of the time, you'd probably be able to, to read it. But of course, um, uh, that did require some degree of interpretation and commentary by by scholars, and you can see down the margins here these um, sort of interpretations of vowels, which um, would have helped uh, people to read it. Um, and uh, and this uh, Masoretic Codex, this um, kind of this, this this was a book effectively um, from the tenth century, um, uh, featured featured the texts uh, of the Hebrew Scriptures, uh, and that's uh, from which has been derived our, our modern Bibles, but. The amazing thing was that when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls, which date back to the, the first century uh, BC, was that, uh, that they bore a remarkable correspondence with um, this, this codex from the 10th century. Um, now that's only one you know, century before Jesus was born, but um, th there was a cl clear commitment to making sure that these texts were carefully transcribed. Um, and uh, and likewise, the, the other key text that we have available to us is the Septuagint, uh, which is the um, Hebrew Bible translated into Greek. Um, and that was done in, in um, Alexandria in the um, uh, third century BC. Um, and again, this, the, the text there, the Greek texts of the Hebrew Bible um, are bear a very striking resemblance. I mean, there are some dissimilarities. Um, there's, a, there's a shorter version of Jeremiah, for instance. Um, but famously, that I mean, the Isaiah scroll in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the Qumran Scrolls, is um, complete and bears an extraordinary uh, um, similarity to both the Greek um, from the Septuagint, which is what the, you know, that, that informed particularly New Testament writers and, um, uh, and Jerome and so on, uh, and also, um, the Masoretic text from the, the 10th century. So it's absolutely, I mean, the, the, the history of manuscripts and how we've received them is absolutely fascinating. Um, and um, I'm just going back a bit. Uh, I mean, the New Testament writers, uh, the New Testament's a, a bit more complex because we have um, uh, many, many little bits of fragments of the New Testament, um, but the full only the earliest complete edition of the New Testaments is the Codex Sinaiticus, which um, dates from the, the late fourth century. Um, and uh, and you know, there are all sorts of similarities there to various earlier fragments that we have. Um, uh, and and these, these were bound together on papyrus, um, as you can see here, sort of um, leather stay in the middle, um, handwritten, of course, um, and um, uh, the Sinaiticus came from um, the uh, monastery of St. Catherine uh, in the Sinai Desert. And of course, these texts survived because they were kept in dry environments um, rather than, um, uh, you know, a, something, a book like that. It, um, we have nothing of that, that kind, of course, from England um, at that time or anywhere in Northern Europe, really, because of texts just disintegrating. But uh, kept in a very dry monastery high up on a hill. Um, this uh, text was discovered basically in a bin <laughs> in the 19th century. Um, and the story of uh, the Codex Sinaiticus is absolutely fantastic. It's a great sort of rip-roaring tale of uh, daring do by 19th century scholars, um, which I haven't got time to go into now, but um, it's well worth investigating uh, more. Perhaps I'll put that in a, sort of a further reading. 
Um, uh, but yeah, we, we're talking here basically about a whole range of different manuscripts, uh, which, which are steadily brought together into, uh, into the New Testament as we know it. Uh, and we can only really speculate about how these texts came to be the defining texts um, in, this, in the first and second century. Um, and biblical scholars spend a long time debating the age of particular parts of the New Testament. Um, but su suffice to say, really, we don't have autograph copies, as in, uh, you know, um, say, Alan Bennett writes a, pray, a play uh, um, um, by hand, um, and he's put that into the Bodleian Library in Oxford. We know that that's Alan Bennett's writing, and it's his play, uh, and it can be studied, and we can look at his amendments and changes and so on. We have nothing like that for anything in the Bible. Um, uh, what we have is the result of much later collections of texts. Um, and uh, you can piece together different fragments from different periods and you can see that they're, they're all um, very uh, closely similar. Um, but there are some dissimilarities as well. Um, the Codex Sinaiticus, for instance, doesn't include uh, parts of John chapter 8, uh, the woman caught in adultery. Uh, we don't know why that is, um, but um, uh, uh, and late, later editions, later codexes, late codices, uh, do indeed have that text. And often if you read your Bible, uh, you'll, you'll see that there's a little uh, footnote sign, and if you go down to the bottom of the page, it would say um, earliest texts don't include this passage, or you know they say that it kind of fits in here. Um, the, the later bit of Mark is a good example of this. Um, uh, and um, when they're talking about the earliest text, they're talking about Sinaiticus um, and the Codex Vaticanus, which is um, Came, again came from Egypt, um, but is slightly later, probably the beginning of the um, fifth century, but is uh, kept, in, kept in the Vatican. Um, there's also uh, the Codex Biza, Bizae, uh, given, given by the Reformation scholar Biza to um, uh, Cambridge University, uh, so, which is also um, a little bit later, but is another very important uh, um, manuscript edition of the New Testament in its uh, completeness. Um, how are we doing for time? I'm rambling on. Okay, good. And um, uh, as, as time goes on, um, these uh, codices, uh, co codex or man these uh, manuscripts, become um, uh, more elaborately decorated. And I, I just, I suppose, I was, we can all think of illuminated manuscripts, uh, which we've seen in libraries, I'm sure. Um, but you know, moving into um, uh, the eighth, ninth, tenth centuries and onwards, um, you'll see much greater care given to the production uh, of these manuscripts in, in monasteries. Um, most, I've, actually, I've got a very small image here of the Book of Kells, um, which are, is perhaps the most famous uh, early, early example of this from the ninth century, uh, which is kept in Trinity College, Dublin, uh, a, bo a book of absolutely astonishing beauty um, in its detail uh, and um, in its art, uh, you know, kind of example, finest example of uh, Celtic Christian art in that sense. Um, you know, amazing production uh, on the edge of Europe um, by, by monks. Um, and of course, the, the real game changer is the, the emergence of movable type um, with uh, Gutenberg, and there, there is a copy of the Gutenberg Bible. Um, in mind in the 1450s. Um, this this revolutionises uh, access to the Bible. You know, it's not painstakingly done in a monastery um, uh, and uh, you know, uh, with, with only a, a small number of Bibles in any given um, monastery, um, but, but actually now widely available. And, and this obviously coincides with um, the Reformation's commitment to uh, looking afresh at the texts of the Bible uh, and making sure that everyone has them available to them in their own language, rather than uh, as in the, the Latin, the Vulgate edition, uh, as translated by uh, Saint Jerome. Uh, a return to the original Greek and Hebrew texts. Uh, and that's probably worth saying too, you know, the Greek is written, uh, the, the New Testament is written in, in Greek, um, but it's very likely that Jesus spoke uh, and the disciples spoke um, Aramaic. Uh, and uh, indeed, some of the Greek uh, of the New Testament is a bit rough and ready, <laughs> to, say, to say the least. Uh, Mark's Gospel is, um, 
and his, his directness um, is, is very striking, uh, but the language is also, there's a sort of crudity to it, um, which I suppose would be um, uh, astonishing to, to, well, not astonishing, but uh, you know, classical scholars would be sneery about it. And I should say, you know, um, uh, the issues around um, how we perceive these texts um, is it, the same for every ancient text. You know, there's, there's not an autographed copy of Caesar's Gallic Wars. Uh, but at the same time, we don't doubt that Caesar fought the Gallic Wars. There's, there's enough evidence to suggest that this, this happened. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and, and the same would be true of um, you know, the history of uh, Augustus um, or, or other characters in, in ancient Rome or, or um, Plato, uh, uh, you know, writing about the same time as um, Ecclesiastes or um, the book of Daniel. Uh, actually, Daniel's later than Plato. Uh, in its in its uh, transcription, um, you know, even if even if uh, um, these texts come to us much later, it doesn't mean that they're not of uh, importance uh, historically um, and uh, in terms of their reliability. But the, the basic fact is we don't have Jesus's words uh, because he probably spoke in Aramaic. Um, there's always a degree of translation, and the only the only writing which we know that Jesus did is when he writes uh, in the sand. And of course, he then immediately, we don't even know what he writes. And he, wiped, he wiped it out. Um, and uh, it's interesting to note, I suppose, that some of the most influential uh, people who shaped our world, uh, whether that's uh, Socrates or, or Jesus, uh, never wrote anything. Um, uh, anyway, what was I, where was I? Yeah, talking about the, the Bible um, in, in the 15th century uh, and then the, the mass availability of of, uh, of Bibles. Um, uh, in England, of course, the 1611 Bible is so important uh, because there had been the sort of tussle around the King's Bible, the translation of the New Testament, uh, the translation of the Bible in King Henry VIII's uh, time in the, in the early Reformation um, and uh, it's then being revoked. Um, and in terms of reliable translation beyond Tyndale's New Testament, um, you know, we, we don't really have anything of, of the kind of the King James Bible until James gathers this range of scholars together uh, in London and uh, commits them to, to working on this new translation, which will be widely available. And indeed becomes available both uh, to, to the English, but uh, um, who had often at that point been using the Geneva Bible. Um, um, but, but of course, then across, across the British Empire, across uh, America, uh, and even today, it's fascinating how the King James Bible is sort of seen as a sacred text in its own right by some American uh, Christian communities, um, that this was a sort of inerrant translation, um, which, which cannot be changed. The revision of the King James Bible, which does have some technical errors in it, um, and of course um, didn't know about some of the, um, uh, the, the manuscripts which were only found in the 19th century, the Codex Sinaiticus being perhaps the chief, chief example of them, um, uh, meant that um, in the 1870s, there's a revision um, of the authorised text, the Revised Standard Version, uh, and that's, um, th that was the, the kind of authority, the, the text of the established church uh, and the universities um, well into um, the 20th century, and then we, we get the new Revised Standard Version um, in the 1980s, again, building upon new manuscript discoveries um, and um, you know, in response, I suppose, to uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls as well, um, uh, to just a sort of deeper, more uh, scholarly um, account, which may not be as poetic uh, at points, may not be, uh, may seem quite dry, um, especially when we, things like the Nativity story, we hear it through Handel's Messiah or uh, Nine Lessons and Carols um, in the King James Version. Um, but nonetheless, it's important that I think we, we continue to, to find out what is uh, the most, um, reliable uh, witness to God's actions um, in history as recorded in the Bible. So what are we talking about? What is the Bible about? Well, uh, and particularly the Old Testament, which is going to be our focus um, this, this, uh, this term. Well, it's an absolutely, when you, when you sort of stand back and <laughs> think about uh, the Old Testament uh, as, uh, or the Hebrew Bible, as, as a body of text which uh, wield, continue to wield so much influence for our society and, um, and in terms of uh, our, our religious communities and the ways in which people engage with God. Um, it, 
it's worth remembering just how it, it, it emerges out of what is in a sense a tiny kingdom here on uh, what's called uh, this, the Fertile Crescent, uh, which spreads across from uh, Mesopotamia down to the Nile. Um, and uh, in a country, in a part of the world, uh, Canaan, um, which um, was bordered by um, much greater empires, uh, the Hittites to the north, uh, the Babylonians uh, to, the, to the east, um, and then later the Persians, um, and then perhaps more significantly the Egyptians um, to the south. Um, and um, uh, the Old Testament is, is a record of a people who uh, were initially nomadic, um, uh, Abraham's family, who are promised this unique role in creation, that uh, Abraham's descendants would, um, would be a blessing to the entire world. Um, and in due course, that, that family is taken into slavery uh, by, by Joseph um, in uh, Egypt. Um, and uh, the Israelites are, are kept to this sort of small nomadic people. And there is some evidence, early evidence of uh, the Israelites in Egypt, but it's pretty, pretty scant. Um, uh, and, and estimates range that that, that that may have been about the 13, 1300 BC, but we don't know that for sure. There's, as I say, there's not um, the textual evidence from that period or archaeological evidence to, to give us, um, uh, uh, to, to sort of corroborate um, uh, the book of Exodus in that sense. Um, but it was the belief of these, that uh, these people have been delivered uh, from slavery by by their God uh, out of Egypt into um, the promised land, uh, which was uh, Canaan, uh, removing those uh, who had lived there before. And uh, the purpose of uh, Israel, um, who, had, were, who were led uh, there by uh, Moses, the great hero of um, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. Pentateuch just means five scrolls, the first five uh, scrolls um, of the Bible. Um, uh, these people were given the law to, um, to witness to the entire world how God intended uh, his people to live. Um, uh, the, the covenants with Israel, that's uh, uh, Yahweh, which is the name uh, God uses for himself to, with Moses, uh, often translated as Jehovah, um, uh, which just means um, uh, it's, it's where God reveals himself in the burning bush to Moses in Exodus um, chapter 3. Um, and the meaning of Yahweh means I am who I am or I will be who I will be. Um, as in it's, it's a, a name which kind of um, evades our categorization of it. Um, and, um, uh, uh, and, and this name is, of course, uh, sacred uh, in that sense uh, to, to, to the Jews. And in, in the Bible, you'll find many, uh, you know, when, when you read Lord, uh, in the Old Testament, it's usually capitals, uh, Lord. Um, that's a translation of Yahweh. There are other names uh, used used for God, of course, uh, but um, that's in the, in the in the Old Testament that we're we're talking about. Um, Elohim is another name which we also come across uh, in the in Genesis. Um, but um, on the whole, with with Yahweh is the name which we will keep coming back to. And Yahweh forms uh, a covenant, yes, uh, with his law, um, but um, the Israelites constantly stray from this law and so um, uh, under the judges. So God, uh, despite um, his uh, initial intentions, gives to uh, Israel a, a monarch. Um, uh, and uh, this is the golden period, really, of, um, of Israel in its history, um, the, the period of David and Solomon which we might speculate to be from the 10th century BC, where the temple is established in Jerusalem, uh, where Yahweh's presence is uh, um, uh, revered, uh, offered sacrifice. Um, uh, but this United Kingdom um, uh, breaks down following Solomon and his son uh, Jeroboam, um, and the, the kingdoms are split. And uh, the Northern Kingdom is taken into exile uh, by the Assyrians in the 8th century. And um, the, the crucial moment, I suppose, is for for the kingdom of Judah, which is what remains, which of which Jerusalem is the capital, um, th this this uh, small kingdom um, finds itself uh, caught uh, in the 
the, the claws of the Babylonian Empire uh, at the beginning of the 6th century BC. Um, uh, initially, there's a sort of conquest um, as Judah becomes a, a vassal state of Babylon um, uh, in 597. And then in 587, Nebuchadnezzar II um, comes into Jerusalem, uh, carts off um, uh, King Jehoiakim, and, um, uh, and no, it's Zedekiah, isn't it, at that point, who's, um, who's left in Jerusalem, um, uh, who has his uh, children killed before him, um, and uh, his, as, after his sons are killed, his eyes are torn out, uh, and the whole Jerusalem court has taken out off to, to Babylon. Uh, all, all the elite. Um, there's some evidence of those who lived. Lamentations would be an example of those who remained um, and lamented this uh, terrible destruction of the temple and Jerusalem of uh, David's city. Um, uh, and it's not until um, the uh, dom dominance of the Persians in 538 um, uh, with uh, Cyrus uh, defeats um, the Babylonians in 539 BC uh, Emperor Cyrus and then allows the Jews to return, the Hebrews to return to Jerusalem in 538 BC. And um, Ezra and Nehemiah, um, two, chron uh, two chronicles, they all um, record this and are from that period and record the rebuilding of the temple, the second temple, um, which is, uh, and, and the walls around Jerusalem um, by, by Nehemiah. Um, and um, this this is uh, uh, the, the new temple is um, completed about 516 BC uh, and then gets added to by uh, later kings, not least King Herod, uh, who's a sort of another vassal king um, of, uh, of the Romans, uh, whom, of course, we know uh, rather more about. Uh, and the belief is that God would come in judgment to establish his kingdom, that he would send, um, he promised this to David, that one day he would send uh, uh, a descendant of his who would... Um, fulfill the original vision of Abraham and his descendants that Israel would be a light unto the nations, uh, revealing to the whole of creation how they should live uh, in relationship with their creator, with Yahweh, who had created the world um, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and formed it, as we heard at the beginning of Genesis. So there's a very rapid overview of what we're talking about. But when you think about it, this is an extraordinary um, narrative um, from this small, um, largely insignificant kingdom, I know, certainly compared to the Babylonian and Egyptian and Roman and Greek empires, um, and yet um, it, it, con it um, um, contains within itself and continues to transmit its own particular vision of who God is, uh, God as one, um, who has a particular vision for his people, which is to be for the whole earth. And it does it does stand out in the history of ancient, the ancient Near East as a remarkable, remarkable collection, a remarkable theological vision, um, and all the more remarkable that it continues to be a, a text for religious communities today, which of course is not true for um, uh, the ancient religions of Mesopotamia um, or Egypt. You know, no, one, no one's um, reading the um, Epic of Gilgamesh, for instance, as far as I know, for religious sustenance, um, or um, yeah, uh, uh, and the, 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 the scrolls, um, not scrolls, the um, uh, the cylinders, uh, which recorded many of the Babylonian ancient uh, myths, uh, which you'll see in the British Museum, uh, with Akkadian, an Akkadian uh, sort of uh, these very simple symbols uh, written into clay cylinders. Um, you know, none of those, those are historical artefacts in the way in which the Bible, of course, isn't. So it is, um, it is amazing. And uh, if you're reading the Bible, his, the Old Testament historically, this is um, kind of um, what we're talking about uh, in terms of a timeline. Up here you can see, um, you know, Genesis would probably take us back to um, 1700 uh, BC if we uh, took it all his historically true. Um, uh, from the beginning of creation itself. Um, I think we've probably discerned since then that the beginning of all, all things uh, started rather earlier uh, now. At least that will be the claim of this course. If, if that's upsetting, we probably need to have a longer conversation about that. Um, but we'll come back to Genesis and its importance um, in due course. Um, and, um, uh, and then uh, the, the history of Israel, the early history, um, as we, uh, in terms of the, the Exodus um, of Moses, uh, of settling in the land through to Joshua, to the judges, and then the period of the kings, 
uh, takes us through to um, the Babylonian exile in 600 uh, BC. Um, uh, and during this period, you've got uh, the Psalms, the Proverbs uh, um, being written because it was the historic belief that um, Solomon, of course, uh, wrote parts of Proverbs um, and many of the Psalms are those of David. So that goes back to the Kingdom of David in the 10th century BC. Um, these colours will tell you the different different genres we'll, we'll be talking about. Uh, this is the, the Pentateuch, the five first five books, then the historical writings. Um, you, you might actually argue that Jonah and Daniel are historical writings. Um, in that sense, they could be bracketed there as well. Um, wisdom literature, um, Lamentations, Proverbs, Psalms, um, Ecclesiastes, Job. Um, and then um, the um, uh, the prophets uh, from the from the eighth century onwards, uh, the early prophets uh, from the northern kingdom, Amos, uh, Hosea, um, and then um, uh, the later prophets uh, who are more uh, Isaiah also, uh, and then um, uh, the later prophets who are are speaking to Israel and to, in the kingdom of Judah it, just before the exile. Oops, sorry, I've gone back there. Um, so Jeremiah is, is uh, the key prophet of the exile in that sense, uh, along with Ezekiel. Uh, and then Daniel uh, is claimed to have been written. Uh, the story is about uh, the, the Daniel in, in the court of Nebuchadnezzar in, in Babylon. Um, uh, so so that's, that's the timeline as the Bible would, would put it to you. But in terms of the literature as it's written down, um, it, it's quite a different picture. And this, this will kind of... Uh, reveal that to you. So um, there are parts of Genesis, for instance. Um, I mean, the, the, the story of creation um, probably is written down about the 6th century BC. Um, but the flood story is a story which um, exists um, in the ancient Near East for, for many moons beyond that, uh, because we had have, we have those on clay cylinders which have been preserved. Um, so the Epic of Gilgamesh and Utnapishtim, who's, um, it's a wonderful uh, little book to read actually, it's amazing, I and mean, it's one of the oldest texts we, we have in the world. Um, but you'll see there a flood story, which is then, um, obviously, the, the, the Hebrews would have heard this in Babylon, um, and they interpreted it according to their own understanding of who God was. And at, at the same time, they then write down their own version of it um, in relation to Noah. Um, so. Uh, so there, there are parts of the Bible which probably are much later, older oral traditions. Another prime example of that might be the Song of Moses, um, which in fact we had a even song the other day, uh, Exodus chapter 15, uh, or the Song of Deborah. Um, the, the language uh, used um, uh, and the understanding of God as um, contained within these songs, these hymns, um, suggests that you know, these, these might have been sung by the people of Israel. Um, uh, long before they are actually written down. Um, uh, you know, and, and there, there may be parts of the Psalms too, which uh, do date from that later period. But the vast majority of the Bible as we received it uh, is only written down from the 8th century onwards, and, and Amos is probably one of the, the earliest texts in that respect. Um, most of what we have is written down um, in the, during the exilic period, um, and so uh, we're talking about the the seventh century onwards, um, but um, chiefly scribes either gathered in Jerusalem or in Babylon, um, uh, or Jerusalem in the second temple period, who um, gather all this material together. Um, and as I say, that that's, um, gets translated um, in the third century and to the Septuagint, but there are texts after that, written after that. I mean, Daniel um, is widely considered to have been written during the time of Greek domination of, uh, it, of Judah, of, um, of Canaan um, in the second century BC. So here you can see Daniel as a much later uh, document, even if it's um, relating a story which was in, in oral tradition uh, that people told about for their time in exile. And likewise, the Maccabees, which are, that's in the Apocrypha, but um, that, that's from that later period. But uh, the, the, the Old Testament, as we've received it, is largely completed by the time um, that Alexander the Great um, sweeps into um, sweeps into this part of the world. So that's a very sort of rapid historical um, overview and um, I realise that when you sort of start pulling the Bible apart like this as though it were any other historical text it can be sort of quite um, disconcerting. I remember my first um, 
uh, um, tutorials in the Old Testament thinking, gosh, I had no idea about any of this stuff. This is really uh, mind blowing. Um, the suggestion that Daniel isn't actually a sixth century text about, um, and so it can we rely upon it as a, as a account of what it's like to be a Jew in, um, in Babylon? Um, or likewise, um, for some people that the, the revelation that the first five books of the Bible aren't all written by Moses, um, that can be quite unsettling. But I, what I hope to communicate to you is um, that there's an enormous adventure and richness in understanding the historical context in which these texts were gathered together and written down. Um, now that's important historically, of course, and, uh, and people would say, of, of course, too, in terms of literary importance. Um, but I think more exciting than that, uh, and certainly more exciting for Christians, is um, the, the steady discernment across this vast period of time um, of uh, the God of Israel um, and his purposes for creation and his people. Because yes, there is a huge diversity of visions um, and understandings of God. Uh, if you read the book of Ecclesiastes, you'll see a very different account of who God is from, um, say, the later chapters in Isaiah, uh, where God is, um, you know, has, clearly has purposes for the world, uh, for the people of Israel. God is uh, using Cyrus, the Emperor Cyrus, as his instrument in the world. You know, the author of Ecclesiastes, by contrast, um, you know, his refrain is, all is vanity. You know, he's got a very limited understanding of God's um, engagement. Um, you know, I mean, he sounds a bit like he's, he's depressed, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but um, some wisdom literature has a very different uh, theological account. Um, but all of this is part of the rich um, engagements with what I would say is a remarkable, consistently consistent um, presence in the lives of a particular people over many, many centuries, and which finds its um, fulfilments. Uh, I suppose I would say this as, as a Christian, of course, but finds this radical and um, incredible interpretation in the person of Jesus, uh, who receives the tradition and interprets it within himself uh, and his own purposes and God's purposes in him, in a way which uh, is seen as the fulfilment of all that Israel had been longing for uh, for many, many centuries, um, you know, going back to to the to the deliverance of Israel from from Egypt and, uh, and maybe maybe before. Um, so, um, as we begin to work through the Old Testament, um, hopefully you'll you'll begin to see some of the the, the crackling of, of God within the um, within the text. You know, this is important as it was for Martin Luther King, as it was for um, William Blake, as it was for uh, Jesus, uh, any number of people throughout history, because it transforms our lives, because it can speak to us of who God is and his purposes uh, for us as individuals, for us uh, as a church, for us as, as nations in the world, uh, and for us as the whole of creation, um, uh, and uh, uh, its capacity to, to, to lead us into the deeper understanding of what it means to be human, what it means to be human and made in the image of God. Um, there's nothing of any comparable uh, significance. Uh, I do believe it's inspired, I do believe it's authoritative, uh, and uh, that it is the primary means by which we know God's purposes in the world. Um, uh, but the only way in which you can find that out is for you to study it yourself. Um, you know, there's no kind of, uh, there's no um, authoritative, external authority which can um, tell you this. Um, I mean, there's plenty of churches and Christians who would say to you, it's, it is authoritative because I tell you so. Um, but the best way to find out the spiritual authority, uh, theological truth of the Bible, is to immerse yourself in it uh, yourself, which I hope is what we will do over the course of this, this course. So um, what I'm hoping to do, um, and there's lots of history there, and there won't, I won't be bombarded with lots of dates in the same way in the future, but I just wanted to sort of give you a bit by way of historical background, is to give all of you a confidence in reading and understanding the Old Testament, um, recognising its different genres, its different theological strands, um, uh, and in relation to different points in its own history. Uh, but basically to help you when you pick up the Bible or hear it in church, to think, ah, oh, yeah, that, that, um, I've read about that. That's, um, that's written about the time that Israel was taken into exile. 
Uh, so then when Ezekiel is telling me about um, singing the songs of, uh, or, or Psalm 137, singing the songs of Zion in a strange land, we think, ah, that, that's about Israel being in exile. So to give you a bit more of uh, confidence in that respect. Uh, excuse the dog barking. Um, and uh, secondly, to give to deepen your own knowledge of God through understanding how other people over many, many centuries have uh, discerned God in their own lives. Um, uh, I'm not going to answer that all. Um, uh, uh, as a background to and as a background to Jesus' own self understanding and his own purpose and mission. Um, when we come to the New Testament. And finally, I hope uh, to give uh, all of us a, a deeper understanding of our place in God's saving purposes um, and um, uh, you know, in that bigger picture, which we often lose sight of in our church life. Uh, someone's banging very uh, aggressively at the door. So why don't you ask questions uh, via the, the, the chat uh, selection here and I'll come back to those. If you need to go now, please do go now. But um, I will send details of the next stage. Um, oh, I've really got to answer it. I'm really sorry. I'm obviously quite urgent. <laughs> My apologies. <laughs> Sorry to have dis disappeared. Uh, hopefully I'm back in the room. Um, uh, I do apologize about that. Um, let me just go back to the screen um, to show you what, uh, I, I will send you this to, to um, for uh, next task, but I'm going to give you a, a few passages to read before the next session where we'll be exploring Israel's story um, and also a video for you to watch. So um, do, um, to uh, 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 get stuck into that. Um, but um, I've come to midday, so I've 